The Lucy is an improved version of the classic camera Lucida drawing and painting tool, which has been used by artists and old masters for centuries. The Lucy uses a series of optical mirrors to reflect whatever you want to draw onto your paper or canvas. Just draw over the image to quickly start your realistic masterpiece in minutes. Learn more and order your Lucy today at drawlucy.com. How do you make art accessible while at the same time support the artists who are making it? I mean, that's the hard thing. If, if we just gave away our work, then we'd be the starving artists. So there has to be an in-between place. Accessibility, getting the art out, art out there in the world, but then the support so that we can continue doing it. Welcome, I'm Doug Casina. I'm an artist, a gallerist, a curator, and a collector. And this is Artbound, where we deconstruct the myths and misconceptions of the art world. We have the conversations here with artists that aren't gonna be found anywhere else. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about the myth of the starving artist. And I have two amazing artists here to talk with me about it. Uh, first, I have Nina Takava, who is with us from her studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hi, Nina. Hi, Doug. So nice to be here. And I have Carl Ortman here in the studio with me. Carl is an artist who also owns a gallery in Salida, Colorado. Thanks for joining us in the studio today, Carl. Happy to be here, Doug. So before we set up this topic, let me just give our listeners a little bit of background about the two of you and why I think you guys are so good for this conversation. So Nina Takava, like I said, is an artist based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And first of all, both of you guys are incredible hustlers. You guys have been doing this in a way to make a living as an artist for quite some time. And I'm just in awe of the way that you both move throughout the world of art. So Nina has uh, several really amazing accolades. One of them is that she's the recipient of the Paula Krasner Award. She also has been involved in several uh, museum shows with her work and is represented nationally in a number of really fabulous galleries as well. And Carl Ortman travels the world through sustainable play, which we'll dive into a little bit. He also has been on the plein air circuit. He has a, owns a gallery in Salida that features his work. And again, is another artist that I'm just in awe of the way that they move throughout the art world. You know, the myth of the starving artist, I think, is such a layered discussion. On one end, we build these temples to art. They are the epitome of what we think is our expression as culture. We have to buy tickets to be able to spend 30 seconds in front of a painting. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we look at the people who create them and we say, okay, they should be doing this work for exposure. They should be offering discounts to us. And it's such this weird dichotomy between the product and the maker. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we've all kind of bought in in some way to this idea of the myth of the starving artist. I think us as artists have bought into it. I think us as a culture have bought into it. And I really think it's one of those topics that I'm excited to kind of deconstruct with you guys today. So what comes up for you when you even just hear the word starving artist? Carl? Ah, uh, wow. No. <laughs> That's what comes up. No. Why? <laughs> Maybe, maybe the separation between the two, you know, what came up when you were talking was like, you know, there's, there's two parts there, the mystique perhaps of how we're perceived by the buyer. And I love to have that intact, all the mysteriousness, anything that we can rub up against and take away some, some something about that romantic ideal that we can step into. It allows us full expression, I would say. The other part of that is, and I think maybe that's where we're, you know, headed to this, this first discussion is like, the impact that has on the artist, huh? Right, that, that they're starving and like they take on the buyer's perspective as I'm starving, I'm at odds with the world, you know, at odds with money. Nita, wouldn't you say that you, right, 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 that like we're enough of at odds with money? You know, you could be making millions and you're making hundreds of thousands instead as a result of like, no, I'm gonna do it my way, right? I'm gonna keep my autonomy. Well, I think that there's, 
I mean, there's so many different variations of what it means to be a successful artist and at what level and at what you choose, what category you want to fit in. I mean, there's like categories and subcategories all over the place. I consider people who are at the level of, you know, being world renowned or being what I quote unquote famous or making millions of dollars. I mean, that's sort of what I, I feel like the first time I ever heard of that was like when in art school, when we talk about art stars, like Laura Owens or Mark Bradford, whoever was. So you got exposed to that early. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that I got a BFA from CCAC, which is an art school in San Francisco and Oakland. And that was always part of the conversation in the late nineties when I went was, I feel like that was this idea that you, everybody had the chance to be the next art star. Well, and I was a little bit older. I was in my late twenties when I got my BFA, but I, so I had been working and I was exposed to the real world, what I call the real world. You know, a lot of kids go to art school at 18 and they've never held jobs. They've never been, it's all very conceptual. Whereas I had worked and was waitressing, et cetera. So I feel like I maybe bought into the idea of art star is like, wouldn't that be great? But I never expected that that's exactly what was going to happen for me. We have, again, these two parallels of the rock star, famous artist, Warhol type of example. And then what about the artist who's making a living? Yeah, yeah. Where do we, like, where did this idea of the starving artist even come from? Is it, you know, for me, I look at it and I think of like Van Gogh, right. who ends up being kind of this idealized example of the artist who struggled, who had mental health issues, yeah. who couldn't sell a painting throughout his, you know, maybe sold one painting in his entire life. And then, you know, years later is the epitome of what you see in a museum and is work is worth fortunes. So where does that show up for you guys? Because that's art history presents forward this idea of artists being tortured, artists doing it all just for the, because they're driven to do it because it's their soul calling out for it. And I do think that there is a part of that, but because of art history compounding that, It's like somehow, unless you're tortured and you're only doing it for the joy or that, or the need or the, that desperate feeling that you have to get the art out into the world. I feel like that is the, what people somehow expect of artists because it's glamorous and it's really intense and it's poetic and it's like ties in with literature and art and music and that artist that has something to say, right? Which I believe is a huge part of it. But at the same time, there's also the practical side of it and the side which is, you know, unless you're mentally ill, you might not be okay with living in a gray room with a single chair and like a can of beans. Like that's just not really being, and that's not being engaged in a contemporary world where you're making art in tandem with the world going on around you. Right. I mean, and if you are at all interested in travel or discovering new things or having new experiences, that all takes resources. It's not just something that you can attain by living in a hut outside of a city, right? So, I mean, and in order to do those things, you need resources. So it's this catch-22 of, it's like you're only supposed to be dedicated to art according to quote-unquote art history, but then if you want to be living and experiencing experiencing things and taking part in contemporary the contemporary world, you need money, you need time, you need resources, right? Carl, have you bought into this idea of the starving artist? Wow, I, you know, I was just going to ask Nina, um, where where are you exposed to these misconceptions the most? I have an art gallery, and uh, I have beginner students come in, I have collectors come in, and they language it. Where are you exposed to that? That um... mostly in school education. I went to a regular four year state college in California and took art history classes as well as in art school. And I think that the educational system, you know, instills like, okay, this is history and this is what you're supposed to know. And because you've got centuries of art history informing contemporary artists, that's where I think it comes from. Where did you hear it most? Like from clients or from other artists? So many aspiring artists walk in my front door and they start using a dead language, you know, and it's almost like a type of creative language has evolved out of it where I'll lead people 
I'll navigate them through themselves so they can get in touch with what they are and aren't going to do and kind of try and I, I have this like secret study of trying to rule out that dead language around um, around starving, around scarcity and, and drop them into abundance and check in with this individual in front of me and see if they're actually going to do something about it. You know, maybe inspire them towards actualizing their their uh, their art, their creativity. Right. So when we romanticize this idea of the tortured and starving artist, it sounds like to me, you know, you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, Carl, that it can be something that we benefit from in some ways because oh, yeah. it's a little bit of the magic of the, mm -hmm. you know, kind of romanticizing what we're doing as artists and the story that we tell each other. But then there's also the flip side of it, which is all these negatives, which then means great if you're this starving artist that, you know, you should be just happy if somebody buys a painting for you at an, yeah. from you at an enormous discount. Right. Or you should be happy with the exposure that you're going to get when I use your artwork for profit in my marketing plan. Yeah. What individual examples have you come across where people have made that assumption about you as an artist and kind of pitched you something <laughs> that you felt was really, you know, in odds with you making a living as an artist? Nina, need to take that one. You know, I get connect, I get contacted online all the time. People saying, you know, we, we'd love to share this and it will only cost you this much or will we have this many followers. There's sort of like the new digital side of it, which is interesting, which I don't personally participate in because I'm not, I feel like art experienced in real life is so important first. But beyond that, people setting up um, open houses, for example, or friends who are realtors or companies that are looking for decor for their space or to fill out their space and they expect or they tell you oh well but the paintings will be available for sale in this multi-million dollar home and maybe someone would just buy the whole thing as is and take all your art and sort of like this baiting you with this idea that you would somehow financially benefit but that just having eyeballs on your work is enough or that's one concrete example I can think of. Um, right. They're, they're like traps. It's almost like we ought to teach uh, the solution to those traps in art school, right? Well, that's what we're here doing right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that's the thing is we have bought in so much to these myths. I think, uh, you know, as artists, we're fed so many misconceptions about how to make it as an artist. I know several people who went to the same MFA program, same BFA program, did the same residencies, and their careers are in totally different places. So there is no one path to right. getting there. Yeah. And I think that's maybe something that, you know, inspires us to buy into these myths because we don't really have direction for that. One thing for me, when I started going into the art field. I, you know, I originally, I, I started this at a really young age, but then uh, when I went to college, I was doing a double degree in molecular biology and in fine arts. And then I switched over to doing, you know, uh, an art history degree and a BFA program. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I kind of say that I'm like incredibly qualified to be a barista. <laughs> and part of that is, you know, this idea that I think we all get sucked into because we've had family members, we've had friends, we've had mentors, we've had people tell us that, so what are you going to do for a living right. as an artist? Right. Have you had somebody that you really respected just tell you, so get a job? Well, I mean, as far as the parents telling like asking you why um, <laughs> why would you do this to us i often and my parents were super supportive but they were like off the wall hippies but um in terms of i'll see i'll meet people now i mean it's funny because i've gone for it and i've done this thing but even i recognize that when people introduce me to their five-year-old and say they want to be an artist just like you one of my first thoughts is kind of like, you better have a backup plan, kid, <laughs> or be very sure that you are willing to go through what it takes because it takes a lot. And it's not just monetary, with, even though that is very real, but it's also being able to walk a pretty fine line between creativity, stability, and practicality, literal production, which is a side that no one ever wants to talk about, but is so very real when you become 
a professional artist, just like literally making objects, like making a product to give to people that is in demand and yet still fulfilling that part of yourself where you're turned on by what you're doing, where you're excited about the work. I mean, it really is. And all of this is happening largely internally, right? You don't really get a lot of support from outside. You've kind of got to figure it out for yourself as you go for your individual situation as an individual artist amongst a greater community. So, I mean, it's a lot of, there's no clear path. I mean, that's the thing. Maybe that's that's the, to summarize, right? There's no clear path to being an artist. I think that's beautiful. Uh, you know, you Good also balance. touched on this idea about another romanticized myth that we all buy into too, about the inspiration of being an artist, that it's always <laughs> about inspiration and not just about actually getting in the studio and making work right. every yeah. day. Right. Yeah. It, I love the idea that, you know, inspiration is for amateurs, you know, professionals get in there and they work. Yeah. Right. That, uh, you get to the easel and you hope inspiration shows up. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I had a professor in college who was really fabulous about it. He's like, go to your studio, start cleaning, start sharpening pencils, do something like that. Because when you're engaging with the work, when you're looking at an unfinished painting or something that was a a non-successful painting, pretty soon you're going to get bored with cleaning and you're just going to dive in and start working. That's great. And that's what you need to start doing is just work and work and work and work through whatever comes up for you. Well, I have a tendency to overwork. And I think that that's sort of the, well, it's just a different side, which is, and I've made a lot of bad paintings because of it. I don't, I have a tendency to just, instead of ruminating or being tortured, and I try and set things aside, but in general, it is, that is the secret that I think is, should be taught first and foremost in art school, which is, and after, which is, you've got to get in here and do your thing. And whether you're cleaning brushes or taking notes or just, working on actually putting paint down you're going to get somewhere and you're going to make some really crappy paintings in the process and there's some paintings out there that i'm like oh man did i really put that painting out in the world but you know somebody's out there loving it and somebody's out there getting inspired by by it somehow because it's no longer collecting dust in my studio right so yeah i think what do you what about you carl do you what do you just go in what how do you start or, I mean, do you have like a work schedule? No, not at all. I can't, you know, I joke with kids. I had three little kids in the other day and I was like, you know, when somebody calls you weird, pay attention to what those attributes are and find where they fit in the world. <laughs> I'm incredibly nice. ADD, right? Like I have 12 projects at the same time. And um, me too. Yeah. Right. And I, you know, yeah. I've learned to tell myself and I'm, I'm very emotionally volatile. Uh, the coffee and the wine doesn't help. <laughs> or, or my, my dating habits. But I find that, you know, I'm in the studio. I could really relate to what you were saying, that I'm in the studio and I'm very emotional or I'm having a tough day or I'm having a lack of inspiration. And unfortunately, I'm the one painting, right? Source isn't painting through me. I'm not out of the way of the painting. But I just, uh, after all these years of doing this, like you're saying, if I'll just stay with it, tomorrow when I'm inspired or I'm on point, um, at least I have something started with which yeah. it painting through me can react to. So keep going. And just because I'm down today, I'm developing work that absolutely 100% sells tomorrow. And I've learned to just be like, it's okay that I'm not on most of the time. Yeah. Have you ever gotten to the point, Carl, where you've had all of these challenges come up and you've said, shit, I need to get a real job? Or have you ever had anything <laughs> where, or right. have you ever had a real job, Carl? How has this worked out for you? Wow. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you know, you're laughing. This is a good one. Um, and why do we even have to refer to it as a real job? You know, that's part of the mythos right there that I'm even buying into that I'm noticing is this quote unquote real job that's not art because art for some reason isn't a real job, right? Right. Well, I will say this on that point, um, Doug, which is, If you're relying on making your art and getting it out there in the world to do things like pay your mortgage, if you're lucky enough to be in that position or pay your rent or buy more um, art materials, I would argue that if you've got to, like if you don't have something else to fall back on, if your safety net does not exist, 
you don't have like your um absolutely like if you're not an, doing an adjunct adjunct teaching or you're not tutoring on the side or you're something but if you only have your art to really rely on i think you make more art and maybe you make some of that art like i said earlier is not as good as all the others there might be some weaker paintings but there's going to be more of them and that, in my opinion, is kind of how you get better at painting and how you discover what you want, which is make a lot of paintings. And, you know, whether that's four a year for you or 40, I don't know, somewhere in there. But um, it does keep you from, it keeps you on if you're like, or if you have deadlines and commitments with galleries where they're expecting five pieces from you in a couple of months, like that's motivation. So I do think that, it, can, it really can fill that gap if you're feeling less than inspired, if you're like, all right, but I still promise this gallery five paintings. Nina, did you get there with some other, uh, some other job or occupation? Did you, did you kind of um, subsidize art? Yeah, well, I waitressed. I waitressed all through college and art school. And, until, and in fact, until I got the Pollock Krasner, the Pollock Krasner, which was just a small grant, of $10,000 was just enough to kind of jumpstart me into finally, it, like I quit my restaurant job when I got the Paulette Krasner and I've had to pick up some work here or there in restaurants, but largely since 2007, I've been self-supporting and sometimes it's like a nail biter and you get cre you creatively financed, sure. but We've chosen a profession where it doesn't have the same career trajectory as other professions. So it's not like we get out of art school, we have our BFA, we have our MFA, and you start with an entry level salary of, you know, right. 30 some K a year. And then every couple no. of years you oh, get a, amazing. you get a raise and you get these accolades and then you can put your resume out to get a different, you know, uh, yeah, a why different... can't we have that system? <sighs> Doug, let's get that system. That sounds awesome to me. I think the reality is it takes a long time before you get good. Yeah. You have to make a yeah. lot of really bad paintings before you're to the point where people are really looking that your work is that sought after. Yeah. You know, I look at the careers of, let's say, the abstract expressionists in New York. Most of them were really starting to hit their stride in their 40s. That's when they first had their yeah. first major solo exhibitions. Right, right. So I keep reminding myself that, and I think that's where all of that hustle that um, happens, the kind of subsidizing the career, all of those things that happen until you get to it. And I think what happens is you have to have that mental fortitude to actually walk through that door and do that work to get to the point where you can have a successful art career. Well, and I would argue you have to work your butt off, honestly, but you're also talking to the, talking to one of the hustlers, right? Which is, I feel like, again, if we're going back to like sort of that, that Hollywood or art history version of an artist, like <sighs> I make, I joke about like the artist with the beret on and a cigarette and an easel with just staring at their, and that is, there are some artists who really do work that way, but I like, I put on my apron and I go to work on like six different paintings. There's like an order to things. There's so much literal work involved that I, I, and I don't know how a lot of other artists do it, but I think that once, but it's like work. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's not just hanging out and waiting and it's, and it's working on a million levels, your relation galleries with the relationships you have with galleries the relationships you have within your own family, your relationship with yourself in time, spending hours alone by yourself, just making things. I mean, that all comes into play in the hustle, you know? And for everybody who can't see what's going on here, Carl basically has a beret on. <laughs> he <this>. does not. <laughs> does he really have a beret? Yeah, no, pretty much though, pretty much. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, take a quick break and we're going to come back to the overall view of the starving artist in society, like how we bought into this as a culture in whole and kind of look at the kind of broader picture a little more and uh, see what, how we can address that. So one thing I'm wondering is where do we go from here? You know, what does it take to change our culture that is bought into this myth? One, you know, I, I remember this anecdote and I, I don't know, what founding father it was who said this, but it was this idea that I'm a farmer 
so that my children can be uh, doctors and lawyers mm -hmm. so their children can be artists and poets. Right. And I think, you know, we also have this idea that at one level, being an artist or a poet is this incredibly aspiring job to have. And I think there's one segment of the population that absolutely strives for that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest of the world that has bought into these myths and misconceptions that we, I, I think we all have bought into in some way or another. Yeah. So what, if we're looking at this bigger picture of the myth of the starving artist, what are some things that we can do as artists, what we can do as culture? Uh, what are some of the things that you see that you can affect change with? Well, we all need to support more artists. I mean, I guess that's the, that's the immediate answer that I have and something that I personally do, which is like, if you've got a couple hundred dollars to buy something from a, an emerging artist at one of their first shows or something local, I mean, that's like a direct action that you can have that like, if someone has money coming in, then they can spend more time making that art or have that affirmation. So that's just on like the like a very micro way. But in terms of larger scale, I remember being in art school and thinking, and I was waitressing and working, you know, and going to school full time. And I was like, God, if I could only, like if someone could pay me $30,000 a year to make X number of paintings that we would just give away, I could be okay with that. Now, I probably would, would be stretched to live on $30,000 a year, but maybe more public works. I mean, I think about, you know, the, the new deal and putting artists to work, making murals or doing public arts. That's where I feel like systemic support from our institutions really could make a huge difference. Like could museums or local governments and there's, and it's small and in piecemeal, but a lot of times it's hard to get support unless you're already very well established. So I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of room for creative thought because the world needs art. I think you they hit on a <laughs> couple of really interesting things with this idea around policy and art. Mm -hmm. Because one of those is, and I remember kind of diving into this once for a PBS special. And what it was, was we were talking about how do you sustainably support arts? And I think most people go into, okay, supporting institutions and nonprofits and museums. But in my mind, that starts to really get towards this bureaucracy where there's several people who are deciding who gets those funds. They have usually an agenda in some case or another, and it might not be yeah. promoting the most interesting and engaging and challenging art out there. And it might actually soften what the art is that we're seeing as a public. Yeah. So I keep going back to what you said, and that's go buy a painting. Yeah. Support artists in a real way. But now how do we look at, is it an idea of education? Do we start the, you know, we've lost elementary education with the arts. Is it something that we need to really start instilling in people like the value of what this can be in a culture? Yes. You know, I look at artwork as the purest form of magic that you're imbuing an object with source, with God, with a whisper, with yeah. a prayer, whatever that might yeah, be. Yeah. And when people engage with that object, it can change their life. It can change the way they look at themselves. It can change the way they engage with the people around them. And it can really affect change in this world. But how do we invite people to have that conversation more and more with art and see the value of that? Yeah, what is the value? Uh, you know, I view it as I'm, I'm out there on a different level. I think, Nina, you're primarily in um, art galleries. Is that correct? Yeah, entirely. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm out there. You might say I'm on the street in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the streets, but I mean, I'm... You're not in the streets in the form of like a starving artist on the streets <laughs> begging people to buy your paintings? It's, you know, I, I may be painting with the homeless, but I'm, I, you know, I'm not starving. I'll take them out to a fine dining meal, but... See, that's an interesting conversation from, from my perspective because I hear the complaint a lot, like something should, like we should value something. But I think if we could open up the access to why. Yes. You know, let's break this into two perspectives. The collector, right? And how we can improve the perspective of the collector. And then I think in order to do that, we really have to pay attention to, the, to our role 
as artists in informing the collector. Like, I think we could do more around informing them, around building value as to why we are valuable. I think we go right into the complaint, like we should be getting money. But I think we've lost our, our understanding of exactly what our value is in culture. And I think if we could inform in art school, I mean, I, boy, I could open a can about the things I think ought to be taught in art school for 120,000 a year, you know, or uh, for, for a four or five year degree. If we can get into, okay, I'm a buyer and why should I value art? Like really hit me on the level of like what I value in the world. Well, what do you value and why should we value art? I oftentimes refer to like art scenes and sort of the epitome of the art scene is New York, right? And in the, in the U.S., that's sort of the seat. Well, well, but this is the thing that I've noticed in terms of just culture, which is it is part of much more, every, like not every day, but it's people grow up with art on their walls. People collect art. It's part of the culture of, and I'm not saying, it's just something that I've noticed whenever I go to New York. Yes. Whether it's someone's parents' house, someone's grandparents' Maybe because they're in buildings and they don't have a lot of windows and they don't have a lot of beautiful dues, views like we have out here in the West. Right. People tend to surround themselves with objects of beauty, things that make them feel good in their interiors. And I think that that building from that cultural base is. And so if you're like a kid and you see original art on the walls of your parents' home or your grandparents' home or their friends' homes, that's normalized. It's like, oh, of course, once I get a home, I have to put art on the walls. So I, I spent five years in the Pacific Northwest. And what I would say is because there's so many windows, there's not a lot of walls. People have beautiful views. They're not spending as much time thinking about these these objects that are inside their home and beautifying their lives. So in terms of culture and change, I would say get more art into people's lives through things like art, la art lending libraries, which has, uh, I had friends in Seattle who developed one and it was really successful. I mean, you kind of got to trust people like regular people that once you show them what their worlds can be like with art in it, I think that they get into it. It's just, it, there's, there really is a barrier between access and also um, priorities. Like a lot of people, it's like you need a desk to work on, but do you really need the painting on the wall? I don't know. I mean, it's, a, it's an individual value, but I think that if you come from a culture where you're used to seeing art and that's a moniker for you of like how you're supposed to be in adult life. And that continues on collection as well as people making objects, as well as people use having this as a career. As an art dealer, my, what I'm hearing is go buy more art, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, which again, I absolutely resonate a hundred percent with what you're saying. I think it is what we engage with as a culture and you know, as a young person growing up around that, I think that's exactly right. That, uh, you know, you just kind of have that filtered into your existence of art. Um, so why is it then that I also have been into some extraordinary houses that have nothing but posters on them walls? I see the same thing. I see the same thing. Nina, I think it's the artist neglecting to understand. I think there are ways that everybody receives art. I think we're out of we're outside of understanding how to verbalize that to make to connect with people. I think we've lost that connection one on one with the buyer. And and you're in galleries, so I think it's it's up to the um, the sales staff to understand fundamentally why art resonates with people and to connect with that need when the buyer comes in. Well, but then here's the thing. When they're already coming in to buy artwork, then they already understand what that need is. They're your is. audience. You know, they're all, they've already bought into that idea, right? So what we can tell them in the gallery is the story of the artist because at some point or another, people stop buying artwork and they start buying stories, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the artist's story, whether it's the, you know, like I, I suspect at your gallery in Salida, you have a lot of tourists that are coming in and they Absolutely. buy a piece of artwork there that connects them with their trip. 
so that when they have that work on their wall and somebody walks in, they can say, uh, let me tell you about Salida. Absolutely. Let me tell you about my trip to the mountains, whatever that might right. have been. Right, and, and I sometimes just have to realize, sometimes it's not even about me. It's My work is just good enough and at the right price point relative to the fact that they wanted to take away a souvenir, mm. right? And I sometimes have to be okay with what that is, but I'm exposed to that. So at first that was a big gulp, like I just did. I, I got there enough. And other times, you know, I really did something in the art and it connects. But I grew up with that ideal that they would buy it because they understood. Well, that's an ideal that you have, right? Have we? Had. So I think what we're <laughs> yes. getting there is Oof. have we as a culture lost that entire understanding of the importance of art? And I feel like that right now in this time, because of the pandemic, because of our we're refocusing this idea of what we find uh, engaging and important as a culture. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that us as a group can say, you know what, this is a way that we have conversation around everything in our existence. Art is catalyst. Mm -hmm. And we can be that catalyst towards having those conversations, towards cultural change, and, and show how important the art is towards having those conversations. See, Doug, that's something I value about you. You yeah. always show me, you're always making the connection of social relevance in our conversation. You've opened up my eyes as an artist. It wasn't there that how is this relevant to the social dialogue? And I think you open up that constantly and you're making me uh, Nina, you, you touched upon this as well. Are artists picking their eyes up from the canvas and going out and seeing the social relevance? So what can we do individually to continue this conversation forward? What can we do to combat these negative cultural messages about a starving artist? Right. Uh, a few of us that have got con gone to the other side perhaps, and understand, have gotten out of the way of this misinformation, I think are having exponential results. And uh, a platform like this that is open to that non-traditional conversation, it's a different kind of conversation, isn't it, Nina? Well, and I think that, I know that we're supposed to be talking about the cultural narrative, and but the answer in the end always comes down to, you've got to give people the support and the resources to keep making art if that's what you think is the answer, right? Like okay. artists keep continuing to make art. I've got one for you, Nina. How do we, so, oh yeah. Uh, now I've, I've had the chance of coming up in a small art town, okay? I got to help make that one of the top art towns in Colorado. And we did it at a grassroots level about 14 years ago. And um, I started to, at first I was very much against artist subsidies. You know, I believe that if something worked, it made money. And um, if you were to throw money at something that didn't work, uh, you know, it's throwing money at a problem, you know, at a problem to solve it. it is, yeah, it's it's yeah. not something to be solved. But as times as time has gone on, I've seen that you can classify, let's say, realtors, okay, uh, versus artists. One is generates culture. The other one feeds off of that culture. So when an artist, mm -hmm. like in Salida, when we, we started to live the experience, Nina, I mean, we were weird and fun and costuming and holding these like late night meetings and discussing possibility, you know, in all these areas, just like the romantic ideals. And we're full of hope and dreams. And with our own dollar, we generated parties that collectors could come to. They could come to any event in Salida. They could go to a restaurant. They wanted to sit with us and drink wine out of a, of a plastic cup, but be awakened by our conversation. I mean, fundamentally, it was a conversation, a, a, an event we were doing, something that was alive that joy came out of. And what I mi simply mean to point out here is there's a difference to notice that some, like that all types of businesses don't have equal status in generating culture. Artists, some of the raw arts like art, music, dance, tend to have this raw component that everything else seems to come out of. It's a feeder. And that I think we need to be more aware because what's happening right now, Salida, is these other businesses come in. They might make more money than we do. But traditionally, because we don't have uh, the, the buying leverage that we don't make as much money as they make, such as real estate, it's an easy, it's an easy comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, 3% of a property makes... You know, as they mature into their career, they're in the makings hundreds of thousands, even millions right now. 
um, and they buy up the buildings and suddenly the cost of real estate goes up. So I think in that middle phase, when you've got a town that's really generating possibility, for us to identify that there are a few things that really generate what restaurants feed off of and clothing stores feed off of that we need to preserve. And I think that's where some subsidies can go. Yeah. But I think it's going to take us as artists knowing how to language, you know, almost having our own lobby and saying, hey, look, we really have impact on culture um, and you don't want something gentrified and yet we don't want to shame growth. What do you think? Well, I mean, my cynical side immediately when use, using the examples of restaurants in a town, it's like, well, then the restaurants want to just borrow your paintings for free to put on their walls right. from your local gallery. I mean, it's hard. You'll get great exposure. Because the Nina. answer, oh, exposure. you'll get great exposure. Tell me about exposure. And then, why don't you go visit the gallery? I mean, it's true. I mean, I wish I had come up with that example earlier, but. Right. Could we tackle exposure is, for a second? That's like something you get when you're outside too long from being cold. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, and, and the bottom line ends up being, I mean, we keep coming back to it, is getting people resources and having sustainable resources for artists to continue making work. So is the answer, I mean, there's institutions, there are grants, there are awards, but oftentimes it ends up being the most well-recognized artists who continue to get those. It's like, once you make it, it's a lot easier to make more. So I just don't really know. I feel like, do we all need to have, like, as as you said, Carl, a grassroots community-based project that encourages people to make art? But then once you do that, you also have the question of curation and quality. And I mean, there's it's it's so complex. Doug, just fix it all for us. <laughs> okay, he's it. in the process. Well, <laughs> get it done. On that, it looks like... There's a couple of things that we need to kind of look at as artists, as patrons of the arts, as curators, is policy, is education, and going out and buying paintings, right? For me, I think those seem like, yeah. uh, and then we'll just solve all the woes of the world. Yeah. So there we go. Sculptures too, and photographs. Yes, sculptures. and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. In all art, uh, just being a connoisseur <laughs> of the arts, because I think part of it too is just modeling behavior that we want to see in other people too, and modeling how we can, uh, you know, yeah. put that out there. So that's one thing that I'm constantly trying to do yes, is how do are. we take art outside of the gallery? How do we have these discussions with art in the context of a larger society? And how do we keep pushing that dialogue uh, yeah. as art, as activator for those conversations? How do you make art accessible while at the same time support the artists who are making it? I mean, that's the hard thing. If, if we just gave away our work, then we'd be the starving artists. So there has to be an in-between place accessibility, getting the art out, art out there in the world, but then the support so that we can continue doing it. Well, and I think that's a wonderful note for us to end on, that those are the problems that we're facing in order to really kind of tackle this myth of the starving artist. And I feel like, you know, we kind of hit the surface on this and there's a lot more that we can dive into because it goes with so many threads and it's so deeply enrooted into the way that we see ourselves as artists in a culture. Thank you guys so much for joining me and diving into this really complex and I think really, uh, you know, emotionally and charged and important conversation. I'm so grateful to have had you guys uh, on this conversation yeah, today. Good to be here. Thank you, Doug. And it was so nice meeting you, Carl. You too, Nina. In person next time with the wine. Come on. Love that. <laughs> or coffee. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Artbound podcast. For more information about the guests and what we've discussed, go to artistnetwork.com slash artbound. You can also find ways to connect with me and the Artbound team. We'd love to hear from you. If you've enjoyed the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. Artbound is an Artist Network podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted by me, Doug Casina. Our producer is Daisha Clay, with audio engineering by Evan Rutherford. Director of podcasts is Jared Mayer. Executive producer for Artist Network is Scott Meyer. 
Trisha Waddell is the director of content. Sarah Van Patter handles all our marketing. And Vanessa Childers does all things digital. If you'd like more information on sponsoring or advertising on Artbound, go to goldenpeakmedia.com. I'm Doug Casina. Until next time.